and welcome to our next instalment of the Heritage at Home talk series. My name's Catherine Buckland, I'm the Heritage Engagement Officer for Eastbourne Borough Council and today we are going to look at the uh, Story of Eastbourne exhibition uh, but really this is a highlight because there is too much in the exhibition to fit into one of these talks. So I'd like to start with this object here which is a tooth from a straight tusked elephant that was found in Terminus Road. Now this uh, molar from the extinct elephant was about, uh, the elephant was about 35 years old when it died and at that time Britain was populated by animals including deer, beaver, rhinoceros, um, hippopotamus and hyena but no humans. So it is an interesting image to imagine these elephants and uh, rhinoceros and hippopotamus stomping down what we now know as Terminus Road, so the main road through the, the town centre, instead of buses and, and humans, we've got these, these animals there instead. Now this woman uh, lived in Eastbourne almost 2250 years ago she probably lived in a settlement on what is now king's drive and possibly could have spent a lot of her time working to get salt from the marshes that would be just meters from her home she was around 30 to 45 years old when she died um, and just over a meter and a half tall the child that she was buried with was aged between four and five years old now, these two people were discovered uh, fairly recently when the, um, the housing development uh, just off the, what is now the hospital roundabout, um, was happening a couple of years ago. It's been really amazing to find out about, about them. Hopefully in the future we'll be able to find out more about them by doing um, testing on on their their skeletons perhaps we can find out whether they grew up here uh, we might be able to have a closer look at their DNA to see what their um, geographic ancestry was as well but we do know that both of them were buried together with the woman's arm uh, around the child so we're assuming that they are in fact mother and child but until we've got that DNA testing we we can't say for for sure they were also buried with these incredible beads now the beads were found at the back of the neck of the child so we don't know whether they were worn uh, as a necklace by the child or on the wrist as a, a bracelet um, of the Iron Age woman. We've also got, um, I should have put a scale in this picture because this the size is quite misleading. In real life it is a really tiny gold coin or stator that was found in St Anne's Road and again this is an Iron Age coin. Coins only started being used in the Iron Age in Britain and this one was found uh, at the site in St Anne's Road that later on was used as a Saxon cemetery. But in the Iron Age was a site that was full of large pits that um, some contained grain, some of them contained other ritual deposits. So the next person that we've got is in fact Beachy Head Woman and she started out as a complete mystery she was um, the first we knew about her was a box that had her skeleton in that was in our store and written on the box was just beachy head 1959 we really needed to find out more about her who she was to try and get an idea of what her life in eastbourne would have been like so as part of the Eastbourne Ancestors project we were able to find out that she lived in Eastbourne in the second or third century 
and was between 22 and 25 years old when she died. Uh, she was just under a metre and a half, 145 centimetres tall. We don't know exactly where she was buried, but we do know that she grew up here in Eastbourne and ate a lot of fish and vegetables. We were also able to, uh, by having an osteoarchaeological analysis of her skeleton, we were able to find out that she had an ossified hematoma, which is a severe bruising of the bone, but not a, not a break, on her right femur. For a little while, that is all we knew about her. We were able to have her face reconstructed so that we could find out what she looked like. And that was a really incredible thing to to be able to do and then to see because she looks like somebody that you might see today in Eastbourne. But she lived here during the Roman uh, period. At the beginning of this year, we were able to have some DNA tests for her and those tests indicated that the place of her ancestry is far from Eastbourne in southern Europe, most likely the island of Cyprus. But we can only guess at what motivated her or perhaps her parents to travel so far from Cyprus to Eastbourne. Some of the other um, Roman stories that we can try and find out more about is Eastbourne's Roman villa. This tesserae here, the small piece of flooring, is one of a handful of, of objects that we know have come from Eastbourne's Roman villa. Although the, the villa itself has been uncovered many times over the last 300 years or so, we still know very little about this once um, huge palatial building other than the fact that it stood in the area now occupied by the Queen's Hotel um, perhaps underneath the carpet gardens next to the pier itself. It may be possible in the future for us to return to the carpet gardens to see if we can find any evidence of the villa but for now we do have a piece of floor from that villa that, that uh, again, is another tangible link to the, the Roman period in Eastbourne. Other Roman things that are more common than you'd think in Eastbourne are these incredible uh, coin hoards. This one was found up on the Downs and contained hundreds of barbarous radiates, the um, small Roman coins. They nearly all date to the 3rd century and were a, a type of fairly low value, value currency uh, made locally as copies of the official imperial coinage. We don't know why these coin hoards were buried, but it was a time of unrest. There were rebellions, civil wars and raids along the coast. So perhaps it was a way of hiding the, um, the money and the wealth that you had by burying them. So we're moving on now to Saxon Eastbourne. The only thing about Saxon Eastbourne that we're going to talk about today is this Saxon man because we do have another Heritage at Home talk which looks at some of the other Saxon people um, from Eastbourne as well as some of the artefacts that were found buried with them. So have a look on our um, on this play playlist on YouTube for that talk. This man we know lived in the 7th or 8th century in Eastbourne and died when he was between 25 and 35 years old. Most of the people that were buried near him were, were buried 100 years earlier. So that, as added to the fact that he had no grave goods, could suggest that he was perhaps a follower of the, at the time, new religion of Christianity. He was another Saxon person that we were able to have uh, facially reconstructed so we can see what he looks like. 
and is another person that again wouldn't look out of place if you saw him walking down the street today and I think that's really really important to remember that although they're the people that we're finding out about the the iron age woman the saxon man here and beat your head woman although they lived in eastbourne so long ago they're really not that different uh, from us now richard de Cloweth, he is quite a character he was a vicar in eastbourne uh, we have zoomed forward a little bit we're now in the 14th century and uh, Richard here was the vicar in Eastbourne at the time of the Black Death. And part of the reason we know about him, or at least we know his name, is because he got into a spot of bother with the church because he was supposed to provide a chaplain to say masses three times a week at the chapel of St Gregory in Meads in return for the Christ share from the um, the seafaring men, the fishermen there. So each catch of fish was divided into shares and given to the men who caught them, the owners of the nets and to the parish, uh, parish church. This was the Christ chair, chair. The chapel of St Gregory didn't have any services for four years until 1353 and Richard was fined for not providing these services. The problem was there probably wasn't any services because there weren't any clergy to celebrate in that chapel, possibly because half the population was dying from the plague. We know later on that he was imprisoned uh, for an unknown criminal offence in 1362 but he seems to have got his own back uh, really because he perhaps accidentally sold six acres of church land to John Weston including a house on Water Lane which is now Southfields Road and made a lot of money from that sale. This book of hours was uh, probably made and, and handwritten in a French monastery for a wealthy or powerful person. Um, the Book of Hours, a prayer book, was incredibly beautifully illustrated or illuminated. And the idea was that by owning one of these books, you would feel inwardly cl closer to God and outwardly show devotion to anyone who would see you. These are the, the kinds of books that the really wealthy would have owned around the time that Richard was the vicar in Eastbourne. This particular one um, was written in 1460 and uh, like I said it really would be the, the very wealthy that would own books like this. This one was owned by the, the Gilbert Davis family who were big landowners in Eastbourne in the 1800s and they brought the book with them to Eastbourne from their home in Cornwall. So I mentioned earlier about the um, the Black Death, the plague in Eastbourne, and this seemingly ordinary piece of pot tells us a really powerful story about that period of history. This one was, uh, it's just a simple pot, uh, probably a cooking pot, was found broken and abandoned on a stone hearth that was uh, rediscovered during building work in Filching Road in Eastbourne. The house itself was abandoned shortly after the pot was made, no later than 1350. So, uh, as I said, this, this pot is seemingly un unremarkable, fairly common piece of pot, but actually it's the fact that it was left there on the hearth that tells us the real story. People didn't live with broken pots around their house and they wouldn't have just abandoned it without a good reason. It's also really important to remember that nothing was rebuilt on this site in Filching Road until about 600 years later. And the date of the pot itself, this no later than 1350 date, could give us a clue about why it was abandoned in the first place. 
that that period of history was a, a really turbulent time with uh, wars and, and pestilence, the plague, being real dangers. We know that nearby Hastings and Seaford were attacked by French forces around this time and the village of Exe on the banks of the Cookmere uh, was completely abandoned after devastating raids. Eastbourne may have been better protected being slightly further inland away from the coast as well as being closer to the garrison at Pevensey but perhaps there were raids in Eastbourne that, that history have forgotten. There are no documents or um, any written information to remind us about it and the house was lost as a result. Perhaps there was an even more terrifying reason for discarding this pot. It was made around the time that the Black Death was sweeping throughout the country. In 1348-49, it wiped out around half of the population. Eastbourne suffered bad as badly as anywhere else in the south of England, and perhaps the hearth and this pot are evidence of a long-forgotten tragedy uh, a tiny but terrible part of a, a much larger story seen throughout the country. Perhaps this house was in fact abandoned. Um, maybe the, the people living there were fleeing the plague. Maybe they they were unfortunate enough to, um, to suffer the direct effects of the plague and died and their house was just abandoned until... As I said, 600 years later, it was then rebuilt. Now, the next person um, that I wanted to tell you about was a an amazing man called Robert Fennell. And he lived with his wife, Clemence, and their two daughters, Catherine and Christabel, in their house called Pocock's Manor, which is, uh, or was rather, near where Burton Road is now, in the sort of Rodmill area. And... We don't know a huge deal about his life, but we do know that in his will, he left instructions to give 40 shillings a year forever to six poor widows of this parish to be distributed on Ash Wednesday yearly. This money was supposed to come from the rent of his land, but when he died... Mr Parker, who owned the manor after the Fennels, kept all of the money until 1631 when the payments were restarted. Um, he died in 1595, um, but once the payments were restarted, he, the charity managing the payments continued in one form or another for the next 350 years, stopping finally in 1982. And there are documents that tell us about some of the people who received this money. This this one in particular um, is from 1833, so not from the, the beginning of the, the charity by any means. Um, but it, it does give us an idea about uh, some of these people living in Eastbourne who would have needed help um, from this charity. Another object that, again, is, is seemingly unremarkable um, until we can find out a little bit more about it is this copper um, jet on. This was found on the site of Pocock's Manor, so uh, literally underneath the floorboards of Robert Fennell's house. Um, Jetons like this were used to perform calculations and particularly for accounting. This one was made in Nuremberg. It also dates to um, around 1580 to 1600. So it is very possible that it actually belongs to Robert Fennell himself. Now, this jolly looking jug is a, a Bartman jug or a face jug. Um, that was also found in Eastbourne. These jugs, uh, we've got a few of them in the collection, are often decorated with these quite distinctive male faces um, and were made of a, a salt glazed stoneware in Western Germany. They were 
used as uh, pictures or pictures or bottles and often contained wine it was quite likely that drugs like this were would have been used by Robert Fennell. So the next person that I wanted us to look at was uh, the lovely Mary Wilson and she lived in Bourne Place which is now Compton Place with her husband from around 1642. Her husband William became the Sheriff of Sussex um, shortly after that in 1653 and they did become known in Eastbourne for their generosity to the poor and their particularly good parties they had at festival times, including Christmas. We also know about her through a interesting story about her husband and a visit from soldiers. So William Wilson was given uh, an important secret in 1648 that Charles I had planned to escape from Carisbrook Castle in the Isle of Wight and that he should do all he could to prepare to receive the king at Bourne Place. William, because he was a staunch royalist, replied that he would do it with his life and fortune. After the Civil War was over, uh, William was correctly suspected to have continued to be a staunch royalist uh, so in 1658, a detachment of dragoons who were led by a Lieutenant Hopkins were sent by Oliver Cromwell to search Bourne Place. William was ill in bed at the time, but the very quick thinking Mary brought a large pie filled with wheat ears for the soldiers to eat and distracted them long enough for her to burn any incriminating evidence in her husband's files. As soon as she'd burned the papers, Lieutenant Hopkins arrived at their bedroom door, but luckily for the Wilsons, there was nothing left to link them to the Royalists. So thanks to her very quick thinking, uh, she did save her husband. She died um, a few years after that in 1661, um, and was buried in St Mary's Church, and William uh, was later buried alongside her. Now the next person, this chap, William Hurst, was born um, in 1740 in Eastbourne, and he founded the brewery that became the Star Brewery in 1777. He did come very close to having to sell it, um, not that long afterwards in 1789 to pay for debts that his uncle Thomas had racked up. The brewery continued for a really long time. Um, the Hurst family owned it until 1886 when it was sold to Colonel Cardwell and it became one of Eastbourne's biggest employers until it closed in, in six, uh, 1967 and was demolished a couple of years later in 1971. He might have had objects just like these ones. This is a tea bowl and cup that was found on the high street in Old Town. At that point in the 18th century, tea drinking was a, a fashionable but expensive activity. Um, and tea was drunk from bowls just like this one um, with the, the fingers at the rim and the thumb on the, the base on the bottom. We've also got in the exhibition these very shiny weights and measures. Um, one of the older ones is from 1795 uh, and the later ones from 1833. Uh, the reason these are important was because towards the end of the 19th century there were food shortages thanks to uh, bad harvests. So this meant that it was more important that the weight and the amount of food that was sold was standardised so that everyone was selling and buying in the same weights in all shops in Eastbourne. So the shop owners would send their scales and weights that we can see here to the stamping station, which was sometimes set up in the pub opposite the town hall to ensure that they were still weighing the correct weight so the next person I wanted to talk about um, was this chap, Charles Wood. He is sitting in the middle of this picture holding the football um, 
and in some senses you could say that he is pretty unremarkable but I think because he he seems unremarkable that is actually what makes him quite remarkable he is just an ordinary Victorian person in Eastbourne um, he was the captain of his school football team and then later the captain of um, a number of Eastbourne football teams uh, worked as a builder, then an architect, uh, and then became the superintendent of Ockland Cemetery and lived in one of the houses just um, just outside the cemetery there on the main road. Part of the reason we wanted to tell his story was because he he is just a normal person in Eastbourne. It was also because we are lucky enough to have this photo of him as well as this photo of him you can see him again in the in the center of the picture there as the captain of his school football team this was Waverley House School holding the football again right in the middle there we were able to find some information about the Eastbourne Swifts team um, that he was once the captain of this report in the illustrated sporting and dramatic news from 1900 um, I think it's a really great picture because it is a photograph but if you have a really close look at those people they are drawn on afterwards as they're obviously moving too fast um, to be photographed in 1900. One of the objects that is um, a really great one to tell us about people in Eastbourne is this token from the Lamb Hotel um, that dates from 1877 to 1890 and tokens like this were sometimes given out by pubs instead of coins uh, for change just because there was a shortage of coins. Sometimes they were given out because they could only then then be spent in that particular pub so you'd have to go back to that pub to to spend that token. This one came from the, um, what was the Lamb Hotel, now the Lamb Inn in Old Town. And we can see the name Sylvester and the initials TB are stamped on the front. So that can tell us uh, that Eli Thomas Sylvester was the landlord in 1877 and T Brown was the landlord in 1883. So this is um, how we can date it so precisely because it was used during the time that Eli Thomas Sylvester and T Brown were, were landlords of the Lamb Inn. The next person that I wanted to look at was um, a man called Robert Collier. We were um, really lucky to be given um, a whole archive of uh, diaries and photographs and postcards that um, either were written by him or sent to him during the First World War. He was born here in Eastbourne um, and was in the Royal Sussex Regiment in the First World War. Another person we found out about through Robert Collier was a 20 year old uh, man called Walter, Walter Jones. Uh, he had written home to his friend Patty Wealdon, who then became Robert Collier's wife and described his war experience in the trenches. He he wrote, you guess I shan't be sorry to see you all again and the sooner the better. It's gone past war, it's murder out here now. That was written less than two weeks before Walter Jones was killed on the 9th of May in 1915 in what became known as the Battle of Auber's Ridge. It's letters like that that are really, really important to remember and be aware of so that we can get an honest picture from somebody who was there at the time of what life was like for that person during the First World War. The next person, we're moving forward through time a bit, um, is this woman called Evelyn de Camin and she was born in London and moved to her fam moved with her family to Eastbourne in the 1920s. She um, worked at Bruford's, the jewellers, 
um, from around 1931. And in the Second World War, she joined the Women's Royal Naval Service and worked as a writer at HMS Pembroke and Chatham um, and returned to live in Longland Road. When she was in the Women's Royal Naval Service, she had to do um, some tests and exams to to make sure that she could do her job properly. And the first couple of tests that she did, I'm afraid to say, were not very good. I think that was something that she really struggled with, um, getting the the right information across in these tests so that she could... Uh, she could join the Royal Naval Service. Um, we know that once once she'd returned to Eastbourne after the, the Second World War, she worked at Bobby's department store, which then became Debenhams, um, and carried on living um, in Eastbourne for the rest of her life. Staying in the Second World War for a minute, we've got these incredible uh, top secret documents that were uncovered in a safe in the town hall um, but were written by the 21st Sussex Battalion of the Eastbourne Home Guard. Now these secret documents were instructions and orders for the Home Guard that tell us about how the Home Guard prepared to defend the town during the Second World War. Now we're coming to the end of the story of Eastbourne exhibition. So the last person that I wanted to talk about was George Grimmond, who was a world famous illusionist, magician, engineer, uh, filmmaker. Uh, he did lots of different things throughout his life. Early on, he was, he started off with magic and with, with illusions. He was only 13 years old when he first appeared on stage and may, was able to make his own tricks and own equipment uh, to have some incredible uh, escape-based tricks. But he also was the producer and director for the um, Eastbourne Amateur Film Society and uh, produced a number of films shown um, or filmed and shown in and around Eastbourne the um these are some of the pictures from the filming um you can see uh, a small cut out picture of george grimmins just in the middle of this this page here these are some more pictures here this one is one of my favorites if you look really closely and we can zoom in at this chair you can see that his that's his chair there with george grimmin director um, written on the back. George was also a member of the Inner Magic Circle and was on um, on the television in televised shows from Alexandra Palace in 1947. Um, he also performed throughout Eastbourne. He performed actually all across the world but most of his time was spent in Britain. This particular performance was at Dale and Curley, uh, the department store. Uh, the corset sale, I don't think, is anything to do with George Grimmond. But as I said, he was really good at a sort of escape tricks, as well as having um, to, or having mastered the trick of catching a bullet in his teeth by placing a marked bullet in a revolver, which was then fired at him. He was then immediately seen with a bullet that had identical marks clenched between his teeth. He performed this trick over a hundred times, but six other magicians were killed while performing it. His performance was clearly very convincing uh, because in 1947 there was reports in national papers that um, George Grimmond had died on the stage during a conjuring act um, and he received many uh, phone calls and messages at home because they they thought it was in fact him who had been killed luckily he was fine 
and was able to report that he was in fact in the best of health. One of the things that um, wasn't on display in the story of Eastbourne, uh, but hopefully we will be able to show everybody at some point in the future, is this magic trick, which was one of George's. This one, um, I haven't quite been able to work out how it works, but the idea is that, that inside the sealed envelope, George would be able to predict whatever was written inside. We're also really lucky to have uh, a copy of his book that he wrote uh, about his magic, about some of his tricks. So again, hopefully we, we will be able to uh, get these out for people to see in the not too distant future. We wanted to make sure that the story of Eastbourne doesn't end with George Grimmond. It doesn't end in um, the 1950s or the 1980s. It doesn't actually end today. The story of Eastbourne is continuing. It really is the whole of history right up to present day and beyond. So we were really keen to ask people what Eastbourne meant to them. I'm going to ask you now, in fact, what Eastbourne is to you. Perhaps you can let us know in the um, the comments or over on our social media pages what your Eastbourne is. So thank you very much for listening. We will have a new episode for you next Friday. Let us know what you think. If you've got any uh, suggestions about what you'd like to find out about in the future for our Heritage at Home talks, do let us know. Comment below or head over to our social media channels. Um, and thank you very much for listening.